Morning. My name is Rick Wesson, and I'm here to talk about abuse and the global infection rate. And I know that I was hungover and didn't get up until noon yesterday, so I expect it to be pretty light. We'll take questions at the end, and uh, we're probably going to give away a few beers to just help everybody out if you're hungover. The best way to do it is just start again. What I'm going to talk about today is uh, we're going to go over the problem, a, a definition of what abuse is, a definition of what bots are. Is that better? Can I get a little volume? Good? Everybody hear me in the back? Yeah, that's good. Is there anyone in the back? Um, we're going to go over the anatomy of a botnet. What does it do? What's it look like? I'm going to give you one. We're going to have a little contest to see who can either take it down or own it. Uh, we're going to look at how botnets affect corporations, and then we're going to take it back up to 30,000 feet and look at what the internet looks like at a global scope and in economic terms how this affects us. And then we're going to hopefully conclude with how we fight this problem. But it's been a long fight and we haven't been successful. So the problem is it's really difficult to understand when your network is compromised or when some of the hosts on your network are compromised and they're affecting other networks. It usually involves other networks because if your network is abusing your own network, you, you know about it. You see the traffic. I don't know about it. But when your network is abusing other networks, that I, I hear about. I see it and I can record it and I can tell you about it and I can tell other people about it. The numbers are really starting to get out of hand. We're talking about millions of nodes in a week. New nodes every week getting compromised. And the numbers are starting to get so significant that people are saying one out of five hosts that are live on the internet at any given point are compromised. That's a huge number. And so essentially, how do we unfuck this? Because it's fucking up the internet. It's messing up my network and yours. And so the first thing that we're going we're gonna to look at is what, what is the scope of abuse? What is the things that we think are bad or affecting other networks in a malicious way? So obviously sending spam, UCE, hosting open proxies. We're having ho open proxies pop up all the time, which are used sometimes for click fraud, sometimes for sending spam. Certainly used for distributed dial, denial of service or abusing IRC in other ways. Uh, hosting botnet c command and control servers. Moving those command and control servers around rapidly. Um, BGP write, route hijacking. When you hijack a route that has some corporate identity and abuse that or leverage it to, to send or deliver some information under their identity. Hosting splogs. Are manipulating links, link rank, and hosting insecure web servers. So what is incentivizing people to create these networks and abuse other people's networks? There's an economic incentive here. And essentially, if we look at the, the revenue that you can derive from a botnet, or how much it costs to deploy one, then we can, we can understand if these two overlap, the revenue to, that you can derive from sending spam, which is high right now, and the cost to deploy a botnet, which is low, and these are inversely proportional to each other, it creates an incentive where these two lines in the slide overlap on the left. And that's the incentive to continue to create new networks, to abuse other people's networks, to deliver malicious activity. Because the cost to deploy it is so low, and the revenue that you can derive from it, there's always going to be incentive as long as these two lines overlap. Our job is to make these lines move apart. And hopefully, in a few years, we'll be able to move the revenue that you can derive from sending spam or click fraud lower, and the cost to deploy a botnet higher make it harder for them to be deployed, make them live less long. So 
once we can move these two lines further apart, actually we can separate and make sure that there's no uh, overlap, that there is a gap between them, that's our incentive. And today, what I'm going to try and put is a number on this incentive on both sides of the map so that you can understand in economic terms what these are to the U.S. population, to businesses, individuals. So let's, let's actually dig into a botnet. Um, you're going to get one in a few minutes. It's been live for, I think, somewhere around 90 days. We've, I've actually requested people to kill it. I've sent information to the registrar that hosts it. Um, and I'd really love to see if somebody could take it out by the time I get off stage or own it. And if you can, I'll give you a beer, a good beer, which is hard to find in this town. I had to bring it from San Francisco. So let's take a look at this botnet. We're going to look at its controller capabilities. We're going to look at the, uh, the proxies that it offers. It has a nice little web controller front end. Um, there's commands that you can make it do different things, FTP stuff. We're going to look at uh, the, the drop file that it creates. This happens to be a key logging botnet. And uh, who, what, and where got compromised. This should be really interesting both for the corporations and uh, people that are interested in porn. And uh, see if somebody can own it or kill it by the time I get off stage. So this is the controller. And for the people in the front of the room, you can see the domain name here, and for the people in the back, it's yops, Y-O-P-S dot biz slash UK is the controller and the drop file. So everything that I'm telling you here, you can go and vet until somebody takes it out. This is the view that you see when you log in. There's no password protection. You can, um, you can if you have wireless, you can go to it right now. So on the left, it has the IP addresses, the ports for the SOX proxy, this ID string in the center, which I'll show you what, what it's for in a minute. And then if you look, there's also the country and the city and state, and if it's connected. And the city and state, so they, they've got some nice GOIP going on here. Here's some more. You can see that they're from Canada, Belgium, United States, which is in Herndon, Virginia. Um, Princeton. And what this is valuable for is for understanding if you need to send a click and that click needs to go from Princeton or you need to go do a transaction from some of the information we've captured out of the drop file, you can make that appear as though it's from that geographic area by using these various uh, identity keys that are in the, uh, the middle of your screen. It has a lot of other capabilities that you can exploit. You can uh, upload files. You can FTP something from another file. You can HTTP get something uh, from any particular machine in this network and have it execute that file. Or you can have all of them do it at once. You can upload host file. So if you'd rather everyone's clicks to any, you know, pick your, your company or domain, um, you can have all of those hosts then send it to the IP address by, uh, by manipulating the host file on each one of the machines. Probably not, no, not news for a lot of people here. Do they send spam? Certainly. Using the, uh, the machine identifier, two URLs, one for the message body, one for the, where you're going to spam. Fill out the form, send it off, everything goes and does the bidding for you. Pretty nice web front end for a botnet. Um, like I said, it's a key logging botnet. and. It logs data. This is one little picture, uh, one, one of the data drops in there. We go through in detail what each section is. First, the remote address. So if you look, this happens to be one of AOL's outbound proxies. Um, it, fortunately, they copyrighted this stuff. So it's a smash by SARS. Uh, the IP address, so the, the TinNet internal address of the host. They all happen to be uh, Internet Explorer. The next two lines are the gentleman's password and user ID for his Popmail account. The next couple of lines, this key logging botnet liked anything that had HTTPS in it, or HTTP, that had a user ID and password in it. So if it had a password field, it was going to get captured, it was going to get put in this little drop thing. And uh, after it had accumulated enough of them, it would send it up to the command and control server where you can download this file. And you can see the third 
thing that this guy went to, the, the third URL was McAfee. So if you go to the first one, you'll get about 100 pop up. And it was pretty obvious, to, even to him, that he'd gotten owned and needed to go do something about it. Of course, the guy is littered through the file. Nothing ever helped him. So if we drill down actually into the, the drop file, we reviewed 30 days of data. Um, like I said, it's, it's been around for uh, 60, 90 days. So at the time that we reviewed it, it was about 80 megabytes. I think it's like 211 last time I looked. And in that 30 days, we had 793 uniquely infected systems with 17,000 data captures from those. So it was, it was sending up multiple data captures per host. And in those data captures were multiple form logs. We got 35,000 form logs from, uh, this is a small botnet, this is like 200 hosts online uh, at any time. 100% of them were Microsoft Windows. Um, it would capture passwords for POP, IMAP, Telnet, HTTPS, POST, form data. Um, and then it would do regexes through the file system. And if it found anything, it would add that to the data drop and send it up to the command and control server. So what got compromised out of all this stuff? We were able to collect 54,000 login credentials. That's a lot. Of those 281 unique credit card numbers, and that was just what we could easily identify. We got over 2,000 email addresses of your friends and family. So this would go down through the file system, look for email addresses, look through your address book, pull them out, send them up, and then we can collect and send spam from those, even from your hosts. 299 identities, which is names, addresses, and phone numbers. And if I had written some better analyzers, like uh, actually gone through a lot more of the uh, HTTP URL encoded data, I could have extracted a lot more. There were posts in there for uh, credit card applications, for college loans, for home mortgages, anything that we consider e-commerce today, this botnet is an example of what's being collected. And if you have a company that hosts uh, some service that's available over HTTPS, some portion of your clients that have logins into that system are being compromised. No matter whether this stuff is SSL encrypted or not, it is being captured. It's being captured before it even hits the wire. So what companies got affected? We looked at, at all the URLs that we were able to identify that had passwords that we could use. We had user IDs and passwords, essentially logins. And the companies are all over the map. You probably know every one of these, except for the paytax.nat.gov.tw or us.armymil. I didn't even go touch that one. But we've got everything, Walmart, SpeedPay, eBay, Verizon, Passport, Craigslist, MSN, Capital One, everything that you can think of. So there were 1,200 businesses, approximately. 35 brokerages, 86 bank accounts, 174 e-commerce accounts. This was just for the 30 days that we looked at it. I haven't gone to see if these numbers have doubled. 863 porn accounts. If you like porn, just go pick up the drop file. There's plenty of it there. You'll never need another porn account. 245 email addresses that were unique that were in different posts. So if we want to value this stuff, um, one thing that we found was to look at how, how much could we sell these accounts for or how much are they being bought for. And so if, if you have a brokerage account, the, this is just one line items out of the whole file, a, a brokerage account, which we identified 35, figured that uh, we were able to find $40, someone would buy them from us for $40 a piece if they had less than $3,000. If they had more, then it was $70,000. So we needed to go log in, figure out how much money they had, build a little set for sale, and we could have made averaging uh, almost $2,500. So there's value even in a small botnet. One of the other things that we do is we capture identities. And this is outside of the, the botnet, but Support Intelligence, the company that I work for, is able to intercept a certain amount of identities that are being bought and sold. And so there's an economy between people that are capturing 
identities and selling them. And we verified a number of these identities by, well, first notifying Visa USA, the FBI, FTC, some reporters. We were kind of getting a little slow with all those people. We didn't feel like they were really reacting. So we, we, we tried to notify the victims. We were seeing them in the botnets. We were seeing them when we intercepted them. And we realized that at the end of each one of these is an individual. And so we thought we'd call some of them and see how they felt about all these things. And so when we, when we first started calling them, we, we gave them their name and birthday and their mon mother's maiden name, their social security number, credit card number. And they, they wouldn't tell us anything. But I made a few mistakes and I wanna share one of them with you. I made a couple of phone calls and there wasn't, nobody picked up. And so I thought I'd leave a message. The message went like this. Last name Milford, social security number 267, 18, 64, 94. 69 Pleasure Palace Lane, Sacramento, California. Mother maiden name, Lewis. Visa, 4583-2468-9185-4162. Expires 1107, security code 102. This identity has been compromised. And I, I left work, it was at the end of the day. Next day I come in, I've got like 47 missed phone calls. And so, I waited around, I knew the guy would call back, he called 47 times in the last two hours. Phone rings, pick it up, the guy says, I wanna to talk to your manager. Okay, hold on a second. Hello? I wanna to talk to your owner. I, I own the business. He's like, what are you doing? Leave a message on my phone. Who are you? And I, I said, we're, we're working with the security, and he didn't give me that. Next thing, I'm, he's gonna call the FBI, he's gonna call the cops. I wanted to tell him which agents we were working with, but the guy was so livid, and he happened to be a police officer, he was ready to come over to San Francisco and arrest me, even though he was in Milwaukee or something like that. So the victims are highly pissed when we can tell them all about them. We had another one where we, were, we identified a, a, an identity, we saw it come across the wire, called the person up, actually ended up with the, the mother on the phone, and she said she had just registered, bought something for her son off of a website, and that was, it was her son's name, it wasn't her name that we had seen. And that was 10 minutes from sale to on the wire sold. So let's look at how botnets affect corporations. We've, we've looked at that they exist, that they're login data, you have one that you can go play with, you can evaluate everything that I've said, you can use it or you can take it down, if you can. But let's look at how they operate and how they affect companies. Being a San Francisco corporation, we went through a bunch of companies' names that were in our database that were also in the 9-5 or 9-4 area codes. And this was a list of some of the companies that, that uh, we identified that we have some information on. And we're gonna drill down in three or four of these real quick and see what they've got. But you all should recognize some of these companies. They're not small. And uh, some of them get unhappy when they get their, num their names on the screen. So if you see yours, ask politely. I'll take it off. There's plenty of other companies to put on here. First one's HP. A lot of people want to know, is Silicon Valley compromised? A lot of computers out there. A lot of big companies that run e-commerce. HP isn't a commerce company that I would classify it as. But we looked at 140 unique IP addresses that were under HP's network space. Many of them were outbound mail servers. We run a pretty large spam trap and we identified a fair amount of their marketing mail in our spam trap. But we also found a fair amount of information of hosts that were claiming to be Starwood Hotels or GeoCities or CarpetBless.info. We said, those aren't HP's hosts, but they're coming from HP's network. That can't be good. Why are they sending us this mail? Why is it landing in our spam trap? Charles Schwab, another financial organization. But this is a company that you can point to and say, these people are doing a good job. They have a bit of marketing mail that we've been able to identify. But um, we haven't 
been able to identify any bots. Pretty good. It's important to point out when people are doing a good job. Lucasfilm. This was interesting because they've been flatlined for a really long time. And then one day, one day they sent out a whole bunch of stuff. Maybe somebody brought in a compromised laptop, put it on the, the vendor area network or um, uh, one of these networks where you segment your guests, which we, we've seen. Um, it was all phishing and, and, and spam advertisements. And it was fixed within 24 hours and they've been flatlined ever since. So that's good. We can detect when these things are happening and we can tell when they aren't. So this was the fun one, Chevron Texaco. They're consistently in our traps. But what's in our traps? It's not marketing information. It's spamvertised adult material. And this is an indication, this is a symptom of the disease. It's chronic and persistent. It's been there for a long time and we can show that it happens at regular intervals. And we're also gonna go down and look at who derived information uh, who derives some value from this? What's the value chain uh, of the spam or adult material that was uh, disseminated using Chevron Texaco's IP address reputation? And before we do that, I just, I have to show you what they were delivering. Something natural and safe, certainly I'm sure many of you have seen this before, maybe not. This is what the corporate network was being leveraged by a third party to deliver to other mailboxes. Size does matter here. So Chevron's penis enlargement problem, which was botnet spam delivered through their corporate MX, spam advertised a link that traversed three web servers with 302 moved. The domains were hosted across three registrars with three different identities that were obviously false. Um, with the hosting services running from the USA, Germany, Russia, China, and the final web server that was advertising that wonderful little piece uh, about enlargement was in China. And I don't expect Chevron to have the capabilities to go and figure all that stuff out, but I do expect that they have the capability to keep it from emanating from their network. So let's go back up and look at the global scope and some trends and statistics about the larger internet. We've seen that, that botnets exist, they're key logging, that we can identify some of those by the abuse, how they send it out or abuse other networks. And now we're gonna look at what the whole world looks like. And this is 100 million, 101 million events that we received over six months. It turned out to be roughly 48 million unique IPv4 addresses. It spanned 12,000 of the 22,000 routed ASNs. So for those of you that have network clue, the next part is really about the global internet. One of the big numbers that we wanna, a flag that I wanna put in the ground or a stake is 267,000 that I know about, new a day. So we looked at the ASNs and, and we said, what number of ASNs do we have that, uh, that have a, a malicious activity that we can identify? And this is a very granular, the, the amount of, of address space routed by ASNs is vastly different. But it's a, it's, a, it's a very broad brush that I'm painting with here. 55% of the ASNs that we looked at, I could identify something on. 48% appeared clean. Now, my, my business partner, said, he, he asked me, he says, well, how much, of the, how much of the routed address space is that? Because just looking at the ASNs is a really broad way of, of reviewing this. So if we look at, at how much address space is actually routed by these various ASNs that we have information about compromised systems on, 95% of it we can finger. That's significant. So then we said, how can we break these things up geographically and look at them by countries? And it was actually pretty hard. There were, there were some ASs that we couldn't look at 
uh, they're, they're ASs that are satellite. You know, there, there's no geography attached to them. Um, but from what we could do, it was pretty easy. People know that China is a huge problem. Here, they're a quarter of it, of the entire planet's worth. The EU, which is a whole bunch of countries, which we have some separated out later. The USA is number three, with almost three million hosts that we're able to identify. And then it goes down from there. Korea, Germany, France, Brazil, Spain, Japan. The ones that we couldn't classify that are mostly satellite. Taiwan, Poland, India, Italy, and the UK. They're classified in the EU, sorry. So let's look at China Net Backbone. Everybody knows about this one. Um, this is the number of new IPs daily. I'm still wondering what the big spike is. Uh, and this was for um, six months, almost. So then we tried to look at uh, the most compromised prefixes by number of events that we were able to identify. And again, China Net Backbone. But then they tail off pretty rapidly, and this is the first, uh, I don't know, 20, top 20, something like that, um, with most of them being in the uh, 221 slash 8. So let's bring this back to costs. We've been able to see that, that these things exist. A certain number of them are key loggers that they're pervasive, they're all over the world, they're in every country, and I want to bring it back home a little bit. The FTC has some statistics out there on identity theft, and what I'm trying to assert here is that botnets are using key logging to perform identity theft, and I need to put an economic value on that. And, and what that value is I'm, I'm using these numbers from the FTC from 2003. And specifically, we're looking at the misuse of existing accounts. So when a botnet captures an existing account, certainly they might capture an identity. That would be the new accounts and other frauds column if that identity was used to create a new account. For the purposes going forward, we're just looking at the cost to businesses of people that have accounts that exist that are being compromised, which I've shown you in the botnet drop zone, in, in the botnet drop files. You'll see here that average per victim cost to the business is $2,100, 2003 average. We're going to use that number. Well, let me back up one more. The global, uh, I'm, uh, the, the, the whole scope for this is uh, $47 billion for all ID theft for businesses. That number is the, about this next slide. The profit margin, if we look at the profits that one can take from identity theft, and let's say they have an 80% margin, that would make the identity theft industry, the largest, most profitable business in the United States. Walmart, Microsoft, Conoco, Chevron, GE, Bank of America, and Exxon all make less than the industry of identity theft in the United States using 2003 numbers. I want to do a little bit of math here. We're going to look at the number of key loggers, the average number of credit cards that a key logger gets. That puts us in the existing accounts column. It gives us an average key logger impacting impact of $700 per month. We're looking at monthly statistics, which are all generated from our 30-day view of our evaluation of the botnet drop file. So if we look at the bot population times the number of key loggers times the percent of captured identities with existing accounts times the cost per incident, which we got from the FTC, 
We look at new infections, and I'm just going to pick on eight companies here in the United States, because we're talking about numbers from the FTC, Verizon, AOL, Comcast, SBC. This is new infections per month from our infection data. And we're looking at 120,000 new infections from Verizon a month. Let's look at the economic impact on the businesses that those infected computers are having on American business. This is losses per month estimated from new infections of botnets for just that one column on the FTC report. We're looking at $90 million per month from Verizon. Does that number bother anyone? SBC, AT&T, and Bell South are really one company. You could aggregate those, and it would be another $50 million per month. The smallest one on here, UUNet, comes in at $10 million as impact U.S. businesses per month because of the compromised systems on their network. I'm not saying that these companies are losing this money. I'm saying it's these companies' customers are losing this much money from business. If we look at annual estimated losses, it's almost $2 billion annually using 2003 estimates and current infection rates. This is worrisome. If, if you could convince these eight companies to somehow help their customers clean up their systems, it would save American businesses $2 billion or 4% of the 2003 estimated identity theft problem. So let's go back to the economic theory of abuse. Our idea is that we need to make botnets, botnets harder to deploy so that they cost more money, so it's more difficult, and that the revenue derived from them is less. But right now, what I'm saying is that incentive is around $2 billion a year for botnet operators to deploy more stuff. That's what our fight is. What do we do about it? We, we're working on detection. Hopefully we can tell you who is compromised. We gotta do something about remediation or it's never gonna end. And then we finally, we have to protect them. And until we do, they're compromised and they're, people are losing their identities, their credit cards. We're gonna receive more spam. We're gonna get more click fraud. And it's not gonna stop. Detecting them is just the beginning of trying to solve this problem. We have to do something about remediation and we have to do something about protection. We have to protect them somehow. The thing that really pisses me off is that they're real people at the end of it. You guys might be able to protect yourself pretty well, but those people are so pissed when they find out that all the shit that's really important to them, somebody else knows, and that somebody else just told them a whole bunch of people in Romania know about it, and they got a big headache, and they're just average people. They don't know how to fix their computer. They don't know what this stuff means. And all of the things that are really important to them that they thought were private are now owned by somebody else. And you can't get another social security number. And that's what pisses me off. And I want somebody to help. And it doesn't look like many people are concerned. The economic incentives are in favor of the criminals and it's in the tune of billions of dollars. That's not new news, but eight companies could change the world for a lot of Americans. Hopefully that is news. That the levers are ISPs, credit card companies, and credit bureaus. And that spam is just a symptom of the disease. That if we have some, and it appears that we do, some tools to use to prevent, or at least to understand who's compromised, that we can then focus on notification 
and then on re remediation. If we don't fix these computers, it's going to take our internet away. It's going to take the trust of the people away. And we might still have jobs, but we might not have a network that's really going to be leveraged for the people. It's going to be leveraged for the criminals. I got to thank a number of people that help me aggregate information, help our company. Without them, we wouldn't be able to bring you these kinds of things. Without them, we wouldn't be able to operate. Spam House, URIBL, SURBL, uh, the other RBL mirrors that provide us data, we leverage to help you understand which ones you're on. Paul Vixie, Bill Woodcock for their donations and access to BGP feeds, which helps us understand where on the network you are and everyone else is. David Ulovich at OpenDNS, who gave us a whole bunch of hardware so we could churn numbers. Randy Bias at Neotactics for giving us a bunch of hardware so that we could capture spam. Aaron Hoover, who put together a little uh, demo that I'll give during the uh, Q&A uh, for doing GeoIP mapping to a real, real time uh, botnet visualization. There's some tools. One of them I make. Adam Waters, who's also my partner, who you can ask. I don't know where he is, but he's around. Um, is, uh, is somebody that helped me put this together. One of our tools will help you, if you're a network operator, understand which hosts are compromised on your network. Microsoft makes a tool at uh, postmaster.msn.com slash SNDS for understanding if your network has sent them spam. It'll let you uh, inspect that, look at evidence. Also, Yahoo's building something, but they didn't have a URL for me. So, questions? We'll take them at the microphone. Estimate the 260... Just a second. Let him, let him. You can repeat the question. 267,000 per day, how you estimate that? Pat was asking how we estimated the 260,000 infections per day. We merely took the number of unique uh, infections that we had seen over the time that we had seen it. It's just an average. Can you quantify the source of the... Do we have a microphone over here? Home computers compromised and being parts of botnets versus enterprise resources. So where should we focus our protection efforts on? The question is, can I quantify the number of home users that might be infected versus corporate users? And uh, that's a very good question. I don't have numbers that I could. Uh, I could certainly do that and, and put it someplace. But um, I didn't do it for this presentation, and I haven't. And one of the reasons that that's difficult to do on a block level is um, because of ISPs and network service providers. Um, there's a certain amount of granularity that you can uh, identify which blocks are, or which ASs are of various um, uh, categories. And there's been some excellent work done at the AS level to understand which, uh, which ASs are of uh, military or uh, government educational um, network service provider or commercial. Good points. Do you have anyone that we can point to that could uh, show us that? It was a, it was a statement, which the microphone's not working, and it's difficult for me to regurgitate his statement. Sorry. Any 
Hey man. Yes, there we go. So with 95% of ASNs dirty, uh, leads me to a question that sort of follows up our conversation at the bar the other night. What do you see as the future value, or even the present value, of uh, internet reputation systems when almost everybody is infected? I see the value of internet reputation as um, if, if, if everybody's infected, if, if one out of five computers are infected, um, what is the value of, of reputation? Uh, it's important for you to not have it stolen. I think if the value is going to increase on reputation, then we really have to do work to ensure that the reputation is actually intact when you're evaluating it, whether it's being stolen because you have a network or a computing platform operating on your network that you don't own, i.e. a botnet that's delivering mail through your corporate MX advocating penile enlargement. That's essentially stealing a reputation of an IP space. If you have a block that's routed that has been compromised by uh, or through the BGP, um, that's not something that a company can even notice. I, I think that if we have one out of five computers that's compromised, we're going to see more of this. We're going to see more spam from corporate identities that have a high reputation. And the same um, worry exists for the BGP. So those that have good reputations now, or reputations that are asserted to be good, um, should be more concerned than those that don't. Yes, sir? Yeah, in uh, 2004, over a three-month period, I developed some prototype software that is very aggressive in reporting spam. As a result, I've done some amazing amount of analysis. And I've come to the conclusion that about, I'd say, 30 to 40 percent, you get an IP address, you've got to find out who that IP ad address belongs to. You have to rely on ARIN, ARIN, APNIC, LAPNIC, and all these other IP block organizers, whoever they are. And a lot of times I find that the, I, that the abuse email is bogus. And I always try to like, uh, try to like advocate some type of, of effort on the part of APNIC uh, to, or on, on the part of, uh, um, yeah, APNIC or whatever it is, to, uh, to get their databases up, upgraded. What kind of effort is being done to, uh, make a, uh, to make it easier to track these uh, hostile activities down? And that's uh, something that I think everybody should address. Maybe Paul can help us with this. Hi, I'm, uh, uh, I'm on the Board of Trustees for Aaron, and I'm not speaking for Aaron here, but I'll tell you some of the difficulties with getting that database cleaned up. Um, APNIC, uh, RIPE, Aaron, LACNIC, they are all membership organizations. And so the staff comes to these organizations either because it's a good resume builder or it's a paycheck nine to five job or they're passionate about it or whatever it is. But ultimately they can only do what the members will agree to. And it turns out the, 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 the rest of the community thinks that having a good who is service with accurate abuse contacts is a good thing. But the network operators don't really get a lot of value from that. If you're UUNet, and you make it possible for the community to tell you that you have spammers on your network, you're going to be spending a lot of time reading the same reports over and over again that are telling you something you probably already knew. And the, in the best case, UUNet loses money when they cancel the, the subscription for the spamming customer. So we're asking them to spend money in order to lose money. And, and until we can uh, remove the asymmetry of uh, this person spends money and that person make, makes more money as, as a result, um, you're not going to see any incentive for the members of these RIRs to tell the staff or tell the board, in my case, uh, we want this done. Uh, it's, it's, it's sad. It, is, it pisses me off too. 
this happens to be a hot button, which is why I grabbed the microphone away from Rick. This is something I have been pushing for. Uh, but even uh, being on the Board of Trustees for Aaron does not give me sort of magical powers to improve that database or to ask the members to ask us to, uh, to, to improve that database. Five minutes, Rick. Any other questions? Um, what's going on here on the screen is uh, uh, a little demo of what happened on Wednesday, February 8th at 5 p.m. I, I just have the United States here, and it's essentially just drawing dots on a map for every time we see some abuse. You can hover over them, and it'll tell you where it came from, uh, IP address, the reason for it. It's a little tool we have for visualization. I figured that if I had done it over the internet, I would have been owned by now, so I didn't want to do that on stage. You have a question, sir? <clears throat> One of the uh, problems is, uh, um, you know, you got two different uh, issues here. You got the issues of the infected machines that are sending out the spam, but you also have the command and control center. Now, as far as the command and control center, if you try to attack that, one of the biggest problems I've seen is that it takes a huge amount of effort to actually get a CNC shut down, um, but since they still own the uh, domain name, it's fairly easy for them to bring it back up, usually within less than a month. So how would you address that situation? Well, I was going to show you, see if YOPS was up. All right, so how would I address the situation where domains can take them out? No, how do you address the situation that it's easy for the actual botnet owner to pick up and start all over again? It takes a huge amount of effort. Whack-a-mole. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's what exactly what I was thinking. And um, that seems to be the biggest problem is that... If, if you're trying to whack-a-mole, it's a big problem. Right. So what is your... What is your um, Solution? Yeah, exactly. My... My attack is economic. I want, to I want to find a way to remove the incentive, to change the economics of the situation so that it is vastly more difficult to deploy a successful botnet and vastly less uh, revenue can be derived from it. We're not going to win until the incentive has been changed, until the economic incentive has been changed. So I'm not saying let's take out command and control servers. I gave you one, it's still up. I, nobody came to claim the beer, so it's going to be mine. Um, I thought these guys were serious hackers. It's still there. It's not owned. It's the whacking a mole isn't going to solve our problem. We have to change the economic incentive. I know that it, it makes people feel better, and and uh, it's an instant relief to see it taken out. And lots of people work on taking them out. Um, I agree that taking them out might not be the best way to solve the problem long term. I think it's a, it's a short term activity to in, in that makes it cost more to deploy them. It makes it so you can drive less revenue. I think, does that answer your question? Right. Then the, the next question is, um, how do you actually increase the cost to the botnet owner? I think by taking out the incentive to deploy the botnets on the com people's computers, and that's done by remediation on the nodes that are compromised, and uh, detection, remediation, and then prevention. So you're specifically about I believe that's one way. But I think my time is up, so I thank you, and uh, have a good day.